Let's begin with a word of prayer. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be made known to the ends of your creation, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, from the first chapter of Mark, verses 29 through 39. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went to a deserted place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went, th he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Today we continue to read from Henri Nouwen's book, The Only Necessary Thing. And we'll read for uh, a little bit of time and then, uh, and then pause and come to a conclusion. A reminder that the words that I speak are the author's words, not my own. Spiritual life is life in the spirit, or more accurately, the life of the spirit in us. It is this spiritual life that enables us to live with a new mind in a new time. Once we have understood this, the meaning of prayer becomes clear. It's the expression of the life of the Holy Spirit in us. Prayer is not what is done by us, but rather what is done by the Holy Spirit in us. To the Corinthians, Paul writes, No one can say Jesus is Lord unless he is under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And to the Romans, he says, The Spirit comes to help us in our weakness. For when we cannot choose words in order to pray properly, the Spirit expresses our plea in a way that could never be put into words. And God knows everything in our hearts, knows perfectly well what he means, and that the pleas of the saints expressed by the Spirit are according to the mind of God. Prayer is the work of the Holy Spirit. God made a covenant with us. The word covenant means coming together. God wants to come together with us. In many of the stories in the Hebrew Bible, we see that God appears as a God who defends us against our enemies, protects us against dangers, and guides us to freedom. God is God for us. When Jesus comes, a new dimension of the covenant is revealed. In Jesus, God is born, grows to maturity, lives, suffers, and dies as we do. God is God with us. Finally, when Jesus leaves, he promises the Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit, God reveals the full depth of the covenant. God wants to be as close to us as our breath. God wants to breathe in us so that all we say, think, and do is completely inspired by God. God is God within us. Thus, God's covenant reveals to us how much God loves us. When we speak about the Holy Spirit, we speak about the breath of God breathing in us. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma, which means breath. We are seldom aware of our breathing. It is so essential for life that we only think about it when something is wrong with it. The Spirit of God is like our breath. God's Spirit is more intimate to us than we are to ourselves. We might not often be aware of it, but without it we cannot live a spiritual life. It is the Holy Spirit of God who prays in us, 
who offers us the gifts of love, forgiveness, kindness, goodness, gentleness, peace, and joy. It is the Holy Spirit who offers us the life that death cannot destroy. Perhaps the challenge of the gospel lies precisely in the invitation to accept a gift for which we can give nothing in return. For the gift is the life breath of God, the Spirit poured out on us through Jesus Christ. This life breath frees us from fear and gives us new room to live. Those who live prayerfully are constantly ready to receive the breath of God and to let their lives be renewed and expanded. Those who never pray, on the contrary, are like children with asthma because they are short of breath. The whole world shrivels up before them. They creep into a corner, gasping for air, and are virtually in agony. But those who pray upon themselves to God, but those who pray, excuse me, but those who pray open themselves to God and can breathe freely again. Calling God Abba Father is different from giving God a familiar name. Calling God Abba is entering into the same intimate, fearless, trusting, and empowering relationship with God that Jesus had. This relationship is called Spirit, and this Spirit is given to us by Jesus and enables us to cry out with him, Abba, Father. Calling God Abba, Father, is a cry of the heart, a prayer welling up but from our innermost beings. It has nothing to do with naming God, but everything to do with claiming God as the source of who we are. This claim does not come from any sudden insight or acquired conviction. It is the claim that the Spirit of Jesus makes in communion with our spirits. It is the claim of love. Even though our emotional and spiritual lives are distinct, they do influence one another profoundly. Our feelings often give us a window on our spiritual journeys. When we cannot let go of jealousy, we may wonder if we are in touch with the spirit in us that cries out, Abba. When we feel very peaceful and centered, we may come to realize that this is a sign of our deep awareness of our belovedness. Likewise, our prayer lives lived as faithful response to the presence of the spirit within us may open a window on our emotions, feelings, and passions, and give us some indication of how to put them in the service of our long journey into the heart of God. The depth of our belonging to God is revealed by Jesus. His relation with God through the Holy Spirit is one of total openness. Everything Jesus owns is a gift from the Father. He never claims anything as just his apart from God. He says that we are called to enter the same relationship with the Father that he has, doing all that he does. In sending us the Holy Spirit, he says that we will be led into a full, intimate relationship with God so that we won't have to be victims of the world's spirit. Spiritually, we are in God, in the Lord, at home, in God. Our true identity is that we are God's children. It is from that perspective, from God's perspective, that we perceive the world. We are called to see the world as God sees it. That is what theology is all about. Therefore, we are continually diagnosing the illusory quality of anything outside of this perspective. Now I know that it is not I who pray, but the Spirit of God who prays in me. Indeed, when God's glory dwells in me, there is nothing too far away, nothing too painful, nothing too strange or too familiar that it cannot contain and renew by its touch. Every time I recognize the glory of God in me and give it space to manifest itself to me, all that is human can be brought there and nothing will be the same again. Once in a while I just know it. Of course God hears my prayer. God prays in me and touches the whole world with love right here and now. At those moments, all questions about the social relevance of prayer, etc., 
seemed dull and very unintelligent, and the silent prayer of the monks, one of the few things that keeps some sanity in this world. Many people tend to associate prayer with separation from others, but real prayer brings us closer to our fellow human beings. Prayer is the first and indispensable discipline of compassion, precisely because prayer is also the first expression of human solidarity. Why is this so? Because the spirit who prays in us is the spirit by whom all human beings are brought together in unity and community. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of peace, unity, and reconciliation, constantly reveals itself to us as the power through whom people from the most diverse social, political, economic, racial, and ethnic backgrounds are brought together as sisters and brothers of the same Christ and daughters and sons of the same Father. To prevent ourselves from slipping into spiritual romanticism or pious sentimentality, we must pay careful attention to the compassionate presence of the Holy Spirit. The intimacy of prayer is the intimacy created by the Holy Spirit, who as the bearer of the new mind and the new time does not exclude, but rather includes our fellow human beings. In the intimacy of prayer, God is revealed to us as the one who loves all the members of the human family, just as personally and uniquely as God loves us. Therefore, a growing intimacy with God deepens our sense of responsibility for others. It evokes in us an always increasing desire to bring the whole world with all its suffering and pains around the divine fire in our heart and to share the revitalizing heat with all who want to come. I'm going to pause there for today and invite those who would like to to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.